It's only lesson two in the series and uh, we were talking about the establishment of the church uh, at Ephesus. And last week uh, we uh, left on a note uh, of, uh, uh, left on the subject of uh, rebaptism because of the discussion in, a in Acts chapter 19 verses one to seven. Again, the beginning of the church uh, in Ephesus, um, why some disciples were rebaptized, why it seems some of them were not, and we just ran out of time. Uh, there isn't a universal agreement here, so we don't have to all have the same conclusion. The Bible does give some information, uh, but there are some things we just have to figure out for ourselves as we, you know, we just pick up the information from different parts of the uh, scriptures. So here's what I believe the Bible teaches on this question of John's baptism and Jesus' baptism and those who lived through the period of time when both of these were in effect. There's a kind of an overlap period there that brings about a lot of discussion on this particular topic. Let's go to Matthew, shall we? Chapter three, begin there. Verses one to six. It says, now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt about his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. And so John preached his sermon, his idea was that the Messiah and his kingdom were coming and in order to prepare for that kingdom, a person was to repent and be baptized, to be immersed in water. If we continue in John chapter three, and again, we're just kind of going over a survey a, a survey of the land there, John's baptism, Jesus taking it over, then the apostles to get an idea of uh, what we'll be talking about. Jesus' baptism, this time uh, Matthew 3, beginning in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. And so Jesus, uh, as we know, uh, had no sin, no sin to repent of, but he was in human form, he was a human being, he was a Jew, and he obeyed all things commanded by God and John's baptism was one of the things commanded to the Jews, those who were preparing for the kingdom, to do. And so to fulfill all righteousness, to do all the things that God had required, Jesus also submitted himself to that baptism. All right, let's go to John chapter one this time. John chapter one, beginning in verse 35. John chapter one, beginning in verse 35. It says, again, the next day, John was standing with the two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So as Jesus' public ministry increased, John's ministry decreased. And so John's disciples began following uh, Jesus. And of course, this is or this was as it should have been. Uh, John was there to prepare the way for Jesus. And once Jesus' public ministry begins, it's natural that John's followers begin to follow Jesus. Okay, let's go back to Matthew. I know you're flipping around a lot here. Matthew chapter four this time. Matthew chapter four, verse 17. Matthew four, verse 17 says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that sound familiar? Does that sermon sound familiar? So Jesus continues to preach the message of John, 
and baptize those who respond to that message. So for a time, of course, Jesus is preaching exactly the same thing that John was preaching. Prepare, you know, repent, prepare. The kingdom is at hand. All right, after the resurrection and the ascension, the apostles were to preach the baptism of Jesus. So let's go to Mark, or Mark verses 16. Verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, or rather He said to them, to the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but he who has disbelieved will be condemned. And we repeat that same commission, if you wish, in Matthew 28, verses 18. All scriptures you're familiar with. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me on, in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the mode of baptism would be the same, immersion. But the reason and the result would be different. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter says to the people who ask, what should we do? He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of John? No. In the name of Jesus, what for? To prepare for the kingdom? No. For the forgiveness of your sins and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So John's baptism was to prepare for the kingdom. Jesus' baptism, the result of that forgiveness and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. John's message and baptism prepared people for the forgiveness and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to come. The apostles' message and baptism told people that the promise of the kingdom was here. And the fulfillment of those promises were now available now. Remember last week I said to you, we often concentrate or focus on the idea of the forgiveness that takes place at baptism, and it does. But we don't talk a lot about it, the indwelling of the Spirit, and I mentioned to you that for the Jews, the big news was the indwelling of the Spirit. Because in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon different people at different times just for a time. The Spirit was with an, a, 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 a prophet so that prophet could speak, or the Spirit was with a, one of the judges so that judges could do a mighty work, or the Spirit was with a king so he could lead. But the Spirit was not with the people. The promise was when the Messiah comes, He will give the Spirit to everybody. Everybody will have the Spirit. Young, old, male, female, free, slaves, everybody. That was the exciting part of the promise. All right, so some people now lived through all of John, Jesus, and the Apostles' ministry. In Acts chapter 12, verse 12, I think it's up on the board there, talks about the fact that John's mother lived in Jerusalem. John lived through the, for example, lived through the time where John the Baptist was preaching. He lived, of course, through the time that Jesus was preaching it and now was still alive when the apostles were preaching baptism. So you have an individual here, certainly not the only one, but you have an individual here who lived through all three of these uh, baptisms, if you wish, as they were preached, preached. Okay, so I just wanted to set that up a little bit from a scriptural point of view to see that there's a history of activity and preaching here that evolves or changes from person to person. Okay, so now we have some commonly asked questions about this issue about people who live through these things. Question number one, when were the apostles baptized? Well, since most of, uh, uh, most of them were disciples of John to begin with, or became disciples of Jesus during John and Jesus' ministry, they received the baptism of John. Go to uh, John chapter one, if you don't mind, verse 35. Well, it says again, the next day John was standing with two of disciples and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. They received 
the baptism of John. Why? Because the first time they heard the message was through the preaching of John. Next question. Question. Were the apostles rebaptized after Pentecost when Jesus' baptism was preached at Pentecost? And why? Why or why not? The answer, no, they were not rebaptized. Because like Jesus, they had also fulfilled all righteousness. In other words, they had done all that God had commanded concerning this matter by receiving John's baptism. In other words, if you had been baptized during John's ministry or during Jesus' ministry when he was alive, meaning before his death, burial, and resurrection, then you didn't need to be rebaptized when Peter and the apostles began preaching Jesus' baptism at Pentecost. I mean, you can, you can deduce that just from logic, but also there's no you know, there's nothing in the New Testament that tells us that any one of the apostles was rebaptized, not even a hint of it. All right, another question. When did the apostles receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? That's a tricky one. Well, they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit after Jesus had arisen from the dead and gave Him to them as He had promised. In John chapter 20, uh, verse 19 to 22, it says, When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now remember, He has died on the cross, He's been buried, and He has resurrected, but He's not ascended to heaven yet. He's still appearing to the apostles and other disciples. It says, and when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And so they were the first, and I want you to really pay attention to this word, they were the first ones to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said He wasn't going to give the Spirit until the cross, until he, his, after His resurrection. So the first ones that He gives the indwelling to are the apostles. He breathes on them and they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that brings us to the next question. Well, what was it that they received at Pentecost? At Pentecost, after Jesus had risen and appeared to them for 40 days and then ascended to heaven, the Lord empowered them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice I'm not using the same word. Before I said, he gave them the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, He gave them what? The empowering of the Holy Spirit. Let's flip over to Acts, shall we? Chapter one, verse eight. It says, and Jesus is speaking, but you shall receive, what's the word? Power, not indwelling, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the world. Chapter two, verse four. Let's go to chapter two, verse four. It says the following, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, there's the empowering, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. That's the demonstration of the power. It is so important that we understand the difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and the empowering of the Spirit. They are two different things. One of the main reasons why there's such confusion in the modern age about what the Holy Spirit does or does not do and the things that we can do and not do as disciples of Jesus is this very simple uh, confusion about the difference between indwelling and empowering. Not everyone who has the indwelling 
has the empowering. Okay? And so, uh, next question then. What is the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the promise that when the Messiah came, God would be with everyone. And so the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is fulfillment. In Isaiah 44 verse 3, Isaiah in a sense promises the Spirit or the Holy Spirit to everyone. Isaiah 44 verse 3 says, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my Spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And so, so in the Old Testament, that's a form, we, what we call parallelism. Parallelism in the Old Testament was a form of poetry and parallelism, there are a lot of forms of it, but one of the forms was the writers would say something in, in one way and then simply repeat the same idea in a different way. So he talks about uh, 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 you know, uh, watering the dry ground and then he explains what that means. Watering the dry ground is a metaphor for giving the spirit to the dry, to the people who are dry, who do not have the spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, it says, um, for, and this is part of Peter's uh, sermon. He's, he's, in, he's preached the gospel, he's exhorting the people to repent, to be baptized, to obey the gospel, and then he keeps on exhorting them and he says, for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to Himself. If you were a Jew, if you knew the scriptures, that would resonate with you. The promise, what was the promise? The promise was of the Spirit. And here it is, he says. And how do you know? How, you know, Peter is saying, how do you know that we're offering this? Well, look at what we're doing. We're demonstrating the, not indwelling, we're demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit. Now in Romans chapter eight, Paul describes the reason why it is important to have the Holy Spirit, if you'll go there. He says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. And if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. So what was the important thing? The promise of the Spirit will be given to you. Why is that important? Why is that such a, a valuable promise? Because Paul explains the Spirit that was in Christ that raised Him from the dead, if that Spirit indwells you, then that spirit will also raise you from the dead just as he raised Jesus from the dead. Okay? And then we learn in Acts chapter 19, verse six, how this power was transferred. It says, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Those were the ones who were baptized at Ephesus, the 12 that were baptized at Ephesus. And some people say, well, they use all kinds of expressions. The Spirit came upon them, fell upon them, came within them, but how do we know which one is indwelling and which one is empowerment? Well, you know it's empowerment because there's always a demonstration of the power. So the, the apostles received empowerment at Pentecost. How do we know? They began to speak in languages that none of them had ever learned. That was a miracle. That was a demonstration of that power. How do we know these people here, the 12 at Ephesus, how do we know 
what they received at the hands of the apostle when he laid hands on them. How do we know that was empowerment? Because the Bible says they began to speak in tongues. They began to prophesy. Okay. So when did those who had been baptized, another question, when did those who had been baptized by John before Pentecost, when did they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? If in Acts, you know, I'm setting up questions here, hard questions. If everybody receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when they're baptized and, and we see that happening you know, at Pentecost, well how did the ones who <laughs> You know, who were baptized before Pentecost, how did they get the Holy Spirit, the indwelling? The answer is they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as Peter and the others began to preach and offer it to all. I mean they already prepared themselves for the day, for this day, by repenting and by being baptized according to John's command. Now that forgiveness was available through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, now that the Holy Spirit was given because Jesus had returned to the Father, John 15, 26, all of those who had received John's baptism were granted forgiveness and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Why? Because that was the promise. That's why they were baptized by John. They were waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. Their promise, however, was on layaway. You understand? It was still in the future. Even your promise, you know, somebody's here is preaching to you and saying, you know, repent, be baptized, and you're listening to this and you realize, well, I haven't done that, it's time for me to give my, my, my life to the Lord, to, you know, to become a Christian. Well, between the time that you hear the message and you go change in the back and get the water ready, you know, there's, there's a time there between the moment you believe and accept and respond and the time that it actually happens. It might only be 20 minutes, but there's still time. Well, same thing with John's disciples. There's just more time until the promise was fulfilled. All those who had received John's baptism were granted forgiveness and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost because this is what was promised. It was a delayed payment for those who had believed and repented and prepared ahead of time by receiving John's baptism. All those who had not received John's baptism and heard the gospel on Pentecost were therefore required to believe in Jesus, of course, as the Son of God repent of their sins, be baptized, notice he says in Jesus' name, and they would receive forgiveness of sin and what? The indwelling or the empowerment? Come on, what do they get? They get the indwelling. What did you get when you were baptized? The indwelling. Do you know why? Because there's no part of the gospel that promises the empowerment. There's no part of the gospel that promises if you believe in Jesus, you will receive empowerment. The promise is you'll receive the indwelling. Why? Because the ultimate purpose of the indwelling is to raise your body up again to eternal life. All right, next question. What about the disciples in Acts chapter 19? Why were they rebaptized? Well, they were rebaptized because they received John's baptism, but they received it after Pentecost. They were baptized to show that they were preparing for the kingdom to come. Paul rebaptized them in the name of Jesus for forgiveness and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He did it the right way and the right reason. You know, if you say to someone, do you, you know, were you baptized? And they go, yeah. Did you receive the Spirit? And the person goes, what Spirit? We never even heard of the Spirit. Well, you know that they haven't really heard the gospel. Certainly, Paul recognized this was the core idea of the gospel being preached you know, by the apostles. So if they hadn't heard about the Spirit of God and receiving the Spirit of God, then something was lacking in their teaching. So obviously he had to teach them over again. Next question. 
why does it seem that Apollos, the one who originally taught these 12, why does it seem that Apollos, their teacher, was not rebaptized, but his students were baptized? Anybody can answer that question? Well, perhaps Apollos received John's baptism when? Before Pentecost. He didn't need to be rebaptized. He needed to be taught more perfectly concerning the coming of the kingdom at Pentecost. His students were baptized in John's, uh, in John's baptism after Pentecost, so they needed to be rebaptized. This used to work better when I had a blackboard you know, and I could draw lines and that, but I think you get the idea. Next question, what does this mean for us today? Because the gospel is the same, nothing has changed. Well, it means that we need to be rebaptized or a person needs to be rebaptized if, if you've been baptized the wrong way. If you haven't been baptized the way that the scriptures tell you to be baptized, I think it's a good idea that you should obey. What did Jesus say? To fulfill what? All righteousness. The one who had no sin, can you imagine, subjected himself to a public immersion. Why? Because he said it was important to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness includes the manner in which we're baptized. So if you've been baptized the wrong way, sprinkled port, some people just baptism of the mind. There are groups that don't even practice water baptism. They just say, if you believe you're entering into a baptism of the mind. But in the book of Acts alone, there are 10 references to water baptism. I don't know how you can infer from 10 examples of water baptism that baptism is just a baptism of the mind, a little too esoteric for me. Or if you have been baptized for the wrong reason, as was the case with these 12 people at Ephesus. They had been baptized the right way by immersion. They were enthusiastic, they were zealous, they wanted to do the right, you know I mean their heart was right. And yet Paul took them aside, taught them the entire gospel and then rebaptized them. Why? Because they hadn't been baptized the wrong way? No, they had been immersed. But he re-immersed them, why? Because they didn't do it for the right reason. And many times, and this is a very individual thing, and I'm not, you know, I'm not you know, beating the drum here to get people to question their baptism. The only question you need to ask about your own baptism is always, why was I baptized? Why did I accept to do that? And I've taught you before that so long as you have a biblical reason for it, that's fine. And there are many biblical reasons to obey the gospel for forgiveness of sins, to receive the indwelling of the Spirit, to have the new birth, you know, to be born again. I was baptized to be born again, to wash away my sins, to, to, to appeal to God for a, new, a, a clear conscience. There are many, many reasons the Bible gives that someone enters into baptism. As long as you have one of those biblical reasons, you have them all. But if you don't have one of those reasons, if you were baptized you know, so you could eat the cracker and grape juice like your older brother, that's not a good reason. So you have to have both correct. If you have one out of two in any combo, I believe that you should do it again. Next question, last one for this morning, I think we're almost out of time here. Is rebaptism common today? Is that something we do? And the answer is yes, of course. I was rebaptized. I was baptized as a child. I mean, if you're French Canadian and your mother is French Canadian and your father is Italian and you live in Quebec in the 1940s, trust me, you're Catholic. You know what I'm saying? Back in the 40s, 97% of people who lived in Quebec were Roman Catholic, 97%. So I was baptized as a little baby. And then at some point along the way in my spiritual journey, you know, I was looking, I, I, I ran into a, a, a group and uh, they baptized me um, 
in the Spirit. They said, we're going to baptize you in the Spirit because we want you to speak in tongues and do all that kind of stuff. So I was baptized in the Spirit through the prayers and the you know, laying on hands of the people at that group. And then along the way, I was baptized again, this time in a lake. Because the, the people there said, no, no, if you want to join our group, you know, everybody who joins our group has to be baptized by the chief pastor. And I was baptized in a lake by immersion. That's three times. You'd think I would have had enough of baptism, don't you? And then one day, as I was studying with a, a preacher for the church, and I remember he didn't insist that I was baptized, he simply showed me the scriptures. Yeah, simple scriptures, Matthew 28, Mark 16, John 3, Acts 2, you know, just the, those scriptures that talk about baptism. And his only question to me was, is this what you've done? He didn't say, oh, you're wrong. You, you know, he didn't say anything like that. He says, all I want you to do is pretend this is your baptism. This is what it looks like. And then I want you to study these scriptures and overlay the baptism that you read about here and overlay it onto your baptism. And if it's a match, fine. But if it's not a match, then you have to assume you're the one who is wrong, not the scripture. And I mean, you know, to an A-type, object-motivated, task-oriented person such as myself, it was easy to see there was no match. Even, even in all three that I had experienced, not one of them was a match. And on a cold November night, the water was not even heated. You think it's not cold in a church building in Montreal in November. I finally was immersed in order to obey the gospel and have my sins forgiven. Perfect match. And I've never looked back since. And I've had a lot of studies with other people you know, who say, oh, you need to be baptized for the dead and you need to do this. Uh, 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 uh. I have a match. So I tell people, again, not to shake someone's faith, but if this is a question you ask yourself, just, just do the match thing. Does my baptism, the reason and the way, does it match up with what the scriptures say? And if we love the Lord, if we want to obey Him, if we want to fulfill all righteousness, then we ought to aim to have the match. Okay, well that's our lesson for today. I promise if Lord is willing, and we're still all here next week, we will actually get into Ephesians, the text, next week. We are dismissed for this morning. Thank you.